dress Bowing here I find my rest Without you I fall apart You're the one That guides my heart And Lord I need you Oh I need you Every hour I need you My one defense my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. And Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. So teach my songs to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my Greetings, church. It is my joy to get to be with you and to share with you what God has put on my heart for this love series. My name is Felicia Larson, and I bring greetings to you from Northern California in the San Francisco Bay Area. As I prayed about your church, what came to me to share with you is love promotes. Promotion, to call higher, to move forward, to give more access, responsibility, and more visibility. Yes, love promotes, and yet partnering with God isn't always an upward trajectory that leads to our definition of success. It's not always a smooth journey. It can be filled with obstacles, some doubt or suspicion, and even danger. God doesn't necessarily promote based on worldly standards of success or even based on our 
level of confidence or in our own abilities. Sometimes in order to be promoted in God's plan or vision for our lives, it may cause us to have to let go of some things that are dear to us. We may also have to let go of some things that outwardly look like success to others. We may be called to stand out in ways that we would prefer to not stand out. There may be those around you who would rather you go with the flow and uphold the status quo. There are times even when other brothers and sisters in Christ might accuse you of doing too much. Like, why you got to be so serious about the word of God? Go back and look at stories in scripture. As you even listen to this message today, think back through some of those that get lifted out of scripture quite often. You might even think of them in context. Many stories in scripture serve many purposes, but particularly they show us what it looks like to be in relationship with God from a variety of vantage points. Part of relationship with God is partnership. And in that partnership, there is often promotion. So how does love promote? In unexpected circumstances, most often, for the flourishing of humanity and to the glory of God. So let's talk about some definitions. So when I say things like flourishing and glory, you know what I mean. Flourishing is a word that I have not used much, but your pastor, Shawnee and I, we went to this conference together this year called Joy and Justice, hosted by The Witness, a black Christian collective, and it was their theme, Rise Up and Flourish, that has kept this on my mind a lot this year. Flourishing in scripture is a word in the Old Testament Hebrew, parach. That is often translated to sprout, to blossom or thrive. It's like a plant in a state of growth, growing towards maturity. Those at the witness, though, their theme of flourishing, they spoke about it this way, and I thought it would be helpful to share with you. They connected it to expressions of joy and the experience of healing that includes rest and nourishment, also as a soul release of liberation from bondage of any kind. Ultimately, they summed it up this way, living in freedom that Jesus proclaims. And that sounds to me a lot like blossoming and thriving, growing toward maturity. Now let's talk about glory. Glory is doing things in the name of God that bring honor and esteem to the name of God. Things that will make others take notice and want to serve God. Kind of like the words that Jesus taught the disciples to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What we do in partnership with God should represent God well. So as we think about how love promotes, let's remember, it can be unexpected, at times we don't expect, in ways that we may not choose. For the flourishing of all humanity, people get blessed. They experience joy and healing, rest and nourishment, both physical and spiritual. Freedom from bondage, living in the kind of life that Jesus died and rose to secure for us all. And love promotes to the glory of God. God gets the credit and all eyes are on the mystery and majesty of God's ability. So let's talk about an unexpected circumstance of a young woman betrothed, meaning she was legally pledged to be married, and yet God chooses her to be part of a grand plan to save humanity. You know who I'm already talking about. It's Mary. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. And it says this, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, 
Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God and you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will call his name Jesus and he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. That sounds like promotion to me. <laughs> and he will reign over the Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One, the, so yes, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. She who was said to have been unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Mary's response to all of this, I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled to me. And then the angel left her. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing and doing of God's word. Here's what I love about God when I listen to this story. God gives Mary agency to choose the assignment. God didn't present this invitation to Mary and Joseph, but to Mary alone. Talk about a God who respects the rights and choice and voice of women. Can I get an amen? As with Mary's story, choosing to partner with God can lead to scandal. Yet it can be expected that God will have your back. Now, let me just be clear, as it has to be God's assignment that causes the scandal and not our sin. Mary knew the cost of her choice. At the very least, she would be exposed and divorced. At the worst, she could be stoned to death, according to the laws in her community for someone who commits adultery. And yet, she still says yes to God. No, she didn't commit adultery, but that's how people would see it. And she knew all of that. And she still said yes to God. The words in Mark 6 let, lead me to believe that there was a cloud of suspicion over Mary's presentation of her pregnancy. Mark 6 verse 3 shows that people called Mary, uh, called Jesus Mary's son which makes me think that people didn't buy her story about being pregnant by the Holy Spirit and by the Holy One, as the angel had promised. Talk about a strange situation in which God gets the glory and Mary made a choice for the flourishing of the world. What I also love about God is the understanding of the human toll that this would take on a young woman. God had her back and sent an angel to confirm her story to her beloved Joseph. You can find that in Matthew chapter 1 verse 20. Mary also went to visit her cousin Elizabeth who saw her favor with God. God often gives us an ally in our times of pain during our promotion. Luke chapter 1 in verses 42 and 43 show us that Elizabeth greets Mary. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord, hear that promotion, should come to me? God will often send us at least one ally that makes being ostracized even a little less painful. If you have known the pain of God's call and the cost of your reputation, let me just encourage you with some words of King David from Psalm 62, verses seven and eight. In the NIV, it starts out like this, my salvation and honor depend upon God. As I was studying, I came across this translation in The Voice. It's a translation called The Voice, and it says it this way. My salvation and my significance depend ultimately on God. The core of my strength, my shelter is in the true God. Have faith in him in all circumstances. 
dear people. Mary's promotion would be one of notable pain. Even though Joseph believed her and her cousin Elizabeth was her ally, her blessing would be mixed with pain. And this truth was not hidden from Mary. In Luke chapter 2, the words of Simeon, a righteous and devout man filled with the Spirit, reveal this to Mary in verse 35. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. Mary was a faith-filled risk taker. At this point, her assignment had already been accepted. She's presenting baby Jesus at the temple and Simeon comes and shares these words with her. And so this news was simply part of the package, not usually something that someone says to a woman with a young child. And yet Mary seemed to be one who was okay with hearing the truth, regardless of its lack of happy ending. If you take a look back at many of the stories in scripture, what is clear is that God is promoting an individual or a group of people, and many of them have a few things in common. You might just consider Hebrews 11, what is affectionately called the Hall of Faith, and see if some of these statements about who God promotes fits their stories. The kind of people that God promotes are those who spend time with God those who walk closely with God. When you look at Mary's song in Luke 1, she sings a song to God and you hear in it many uh, references to things in the Psalms and in Lamentations and in places, things that the prophets may have said that she may have heard as she listened as a child and as she grew. She was intimately acquainted with God's word and walked with and spoke about and spent time with God. I also think about the disciples when Jesus called them, they immediately dropped everything to walk with their rabbi. Those whom God promotes also seek to know the word of God, whether that's the writings inspired by God, what we would call the Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament, and even the New Testament, of course, is inspired by God. But in the New Testament, believers, we see Jesus, the Son of God, called the Word. In the Gospel of John, he is referred to as the Word. What I also love about the Gospel of John is in John 17, 3, he says this, now eternal life is that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We talk about eternal life, we do in this day and age as something that we experience after death and yet scripture tells us that it begins with knowing God and in the process coming to know Jesus Christ whom God sent. That starts now. God promotes those who spend time with and walk with and get to know the word. God also promotes those who trust. Think about Hebrews 11, where it says that, tr that you know, that uh, faith is about trust. It's about hope. And what I love is that trust happens even when what is required doesn't necessarily make human sense. You see, scripture says that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, that those who have faith in him, even when it doesn't make sense. You know, I think about John chapter six, when Jesus lays out this hard teaching to a large group of disciples and then turns to his 12 and says, are you going to leave too? Jesus is talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And then Peter turns and says in John six, verses 68 through 69, Lord, where would we go? <laughs> you have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. As Peter trusted Jesus in the face of this hard teaching, Jesus shows us his trust in the Father. Peter shows trust in Jesus and Jesus' life shows, shows us trust in the Father. As Jesus comes to the time when he will spill that blood. He pleads with God in earnest for another way to save the world. And yet in the end, Jesus trusts the will of the Father. 
God also promotes those who are willing to look foolish in the face of human wisdom. We see Paul's encouragement in 1 Corinthians chapters 1, chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. I'm just going to turn there briefly because I want you to hear it. He says this, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And in verse 18, he says that the foolishness of the message of the gospel that we are preaching, the message of the cross, is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Love promotes, friends. Love promotes those who are willing to walk with, spend time with, and seek God to know him through his word and to trust God even when it doesn't make sense and when it could cause us to look foolish. Love promotes in unexpected ways for the flourishing of humanity and to the glory of God. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 18, the very message that we have been given to preach, it is freedom to those who are willing to believe in its foolishness. Because it can sound kind of foolish that 2,000 years ago, God sent his son to die on the cross and to rise again, to break the chains of this world system. It can sound foolish, and yet we preach it anyway. Why? Because in death, Jesus was promoted. Talk about an unexpected way to be exalted. Jesus chose humility over what would look like victory to us as humans. In doing so, God made Jesus victorious. This is what Paul says to the people in Philippi when in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, he says this to them. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, being made in the like in human likeness, oh, excuse me, nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place to give him the name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and in, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue would acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Did you hear it? He was obedient even to death on the cross. That was for the flourishing of all humanity. And he did that to the glory of God, the Father. When every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord, that is to the glory of God. What I do want to draw our attention to is that Jesus didn't just sit back in glory and in his power and just relish in it. No, instead, we see in scripture that when Jesus was endowed with power, he shared it and promoted his disciples, commissioning them into all the world. You know it. It's the Great Commission. It's found in Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19. It says this, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Jesus's immediate response to being exalted was to share in an unexpected way. His disciples were not rabbis or teachers of the law, and yet he entrusted the most good news, the largest teaching and preaching to them for the flourishing of all humanity and to the glory of God. And we who live as those who have been taught and baptized are also commissioned to share this good news. Love promotes us all 
as love transforms us into the likeness of Jesus. In Romans 8, 29 and 30, it says this, it tells us that the goal of salvation is transformation into the image of God's son. Verse 29 says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And then we are called and we are justified and are glorified. This glorification is a word from the Greek doxazo, meaning to have God bestow honor upon us. That sounds like a promotion, dear friends. And being glorified is not intended to puff us up, but rather to cause us to remember that our promotion is intended to promote the good news of God's love. Our promotion is intended to promote the good news of God's love. That love that brings peace and hope to a hurting, confused, and fallen world. May we use our gifts, dear brothers and sisters, whether we think them big or small, grand or ordinary. May we use them to join in on this rescue mission that Jesus has commissioned us as his disciples to share with the world. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, we thank you for the ways that, you, that your love promotes. We thank you that we can walk closely with you and come to know your word. We thank you that you love us and are willing to join us to your great mission to bring peace and good news to a hurting, confused, and fallen world. May we never get puffed up by your promotion, but may we, like Jesus, consider it an honor that you have bestowed upon us. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, church, for this honor to get to be with you. I pray that you were blessed by this message and look forward to the next time when I will get to be with you. Blessings on you all. Lord, make me an instrument of peace, an instrument of peace. Lord, make me an instrument of peace, an instrument of peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love where there is darkness let me so light for in the giving we shall receive and in the dying we're given life instrument of peace an instrument of peace Lord make me an instrument of peace an instrument of peace where there is sorrow let me so hope where there is doubt let me so faith where there is injury your pardon give your consolation to those in pain lord make me an instrument of peace an instrument of peace Lord make me an instrument
instrument of peace, an instrument of peace.